Well, for those who don't know me, my name is Michael Allen. I'm the Associate Pastor of Youth and Discipleship here at Cross Point. So I want to welcome everyone for coming out on this dreary, rainy day, or for those who are watching online, perhaps because you saw the rain and you couldn't find an umbrella, um, or if you were simply unable to join us, we are so thankful to be gathering here today. And we're so thankful for things like technology to be able to send out our signal to the world, really. Technology is this beautiful uh, um, opportunity to connect with people and to connect people in ways that we never imagined before. And so we thank you for joining us, and we are excited to hear from the word of the Lord today. This weekend, um, and tomorrow specifically, we are recognizing Memorial Day. On Memorial Day, in the U.S., we remember those who died in service to their country, those who are no longer with us. And doing so affords us an opportunity for a unique kind of lament, a, a kind of lament that's shared not just in the Christian church, but that we get to share with the country as well. Businesses, and I have thoughts on this, but businesses will promote sales across Memorial Day weekend we get to gather with family and friends. And we get to celebrate, though perhaps while grieving those who are with us no longer. And in that, we as the church have a unique opportunity to step into our society and demonstrate healthy and holy lament. How long, O oh Lord? Some of you may already know this about me. I've alluded to it previously. Uh, but my personal conviction, please say that, personal conviction, um, is that a Christian ethic of nonviolence is an appropriate posture to take when one considers the biblical narrative. Because of this specifically for me, the presence of war and violence in the world is a frequent lament in my personal prayers. How long, O oh Lord? How long must our family from Myanmar suffer and die at the hands of evil men and women. Hmm. How long, O oh Lord, must terrorists, domestic and otherwise, continue to plague countries around the world? How long, O oh Lord, must countries continue to fight civil wars? God, don't they see the wonder of Imago Dei, the very image of the creator God in those whom they are fighting and killing? How long, O oh Lord? At any given time, about a quarter of our world is at war. Some are intranational, right, within the borders of one country. Some are international wars between two or more countries. The United States itself has spent an overwhelming majority of its history at war. In 2017, which is the last time I read the statistic, it was something like 93% of the United States history was lived in war. Daniel Migliore, in his book, Faith Seeking Understanding, has a quote that I think is helpful to dwell on, and it's a long one, but it's, I think, important for us to think on it. He says this, it is of course true that the crucifixion of Christ manifests the world's violent judgment on the grace of God, but at a far deeper level, the cross is God's own terrible judgment on a sinful and violent world. Refusing to oppose evil with evil and violence with violence, the crucified Christ defeats the hatred that inspires violence and the spirit of revenge that prompts counterviolence. The weakness of God proves superior to violent power and its endless cycles. And so as we think on Memorial Day, as we gather with family, perhaps enjoy a dip in the pool or perhaps just go outside if you want to cool off, <laughs> The day also affords us an opportunity to speak prophetically into the culture around us, demonstrating a lament that is forged not from grief without hope, but from grief and mourning and fear that is covered in the peace and comfort of a crucified lamb. The hope that one day we will no longer need to have Memorial Day. So, 
if you would join with me in turning to Habakkuk chapter 3 in your Bibles as we finish our journey with this prophet of the Lord. I would encourage you, even if you have a digital Bible, even if you love it, even if all your notes are there, I would encourage you to silence it and put it away and use, use a physical Bible today. If you don't have one, we have them in the pews for you. If you're like Michael, I don't even think I could find Habakkuk in a hard copy Bible. Uh, if you're using the pew Bible, I can tell you it's page 808. Okay? Um, I love digital Bibles. I use them often, but I also know those red dots can grab us. That email from work or from friends or that Facebook notification can pull us And I think it's important for us to dwell on the words that God revealed to us. So as we all turn there, again, it's page 808 if you're using a pew Bible. Feel free to share if you you need. As you turn there, I want to offer a prayer for us that comes from the Scottish minister, George Matheson. I adjusted it slightly for congregational language. Will you join with me in prayer? Divine Spirit, illumine to us the words of the Lord. Show us the wealth of glory that lies beneath the old familiar stories. Teach us the depths of meaning hidden in the songs of Zion. Raise us to the heights of aspiration that is reached by the wings of the prophet. Lift us to the summit of faith that is trod by the feet of the apostle. Open our eyes that we may behold wondrous things out of your law. Amen. If you were with us last week or really throughout this service or throughout the series, you will recall that Habakkuk just received an intense vision of power and magnitude um, from the Lord of the Lord. So if you missed last week, I highly encourage you to go back and read that, listen to Dave's message on it. But we're going to join with the prophet today, starting in verse 16. Habakkuk said, I heard and my heart pounded. My lips quivered at the sound. Decay crept into my bones and my legs trembled. Yet I will wait patiently for the day of calamity to come on the nation invading us. Though the fig tree does not bud and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to tread on the heights for the director of music on my stringed instruments." I want you, I want to give you permission, you don't really need my permission, but I'm going to give you permission. I want you to think on that thing you're afraid of. The thing that maybe you've never admitted to anyone, the thing that maybe at least you haven't wanted to admit to someone. The thing that spurs your anxiety, that makes you sweat, that keeps you up at night, that consumes your thoughts when you would rather think about literally anything else. I'm not talking in this moment about the arachnophobias, though as an arachnophobe, they have eight legs, it's weird. I'm there with you. But I'm not talking about those. I'm not talking about the fear of heights. I want you to think on the deep fear, the thing that makes you feel fear in your bones, the fear that maybe is connected to how you view your identity or how you presume others view your identity. Most of us are walking around with a fear or fears that we hide, or at least we try to, right? Maybe it's fear of what the diagnosis means for you or your family or your life expectancy or your lived experience moving forward. Maybe it's fear for a family member, for their diagnosis, right? For for your parents' diagnosis, for a sibling or a child. Maybe it's fear for yours or their marriage, or yours or their relationship with the Lord. Maybe for you, you're afraid you won't have a job soon, or you're afraid you won't even be able to find one. And even if you do, maybe you're afraid that you won't be able to care for your family, provide food, clothing, shelter. Maybe you're afraid of having that hard conversation with somebody 
you deeply care for, who's trapped in a cycle of addiction or abuse. Maybe you're afraid of admitting that you're caught in a cycle of addiction or abuse. Maybe you're afraid to go home to a relationship that is less than comforting, that is unsafe. Or maybe you're afraid that if just one more person cuts you off in traffic, you really just might snap. Or maybe, just maybe, you're afraid to admit that you, like all of those around you in your daily life and in this room, are a sinner who's in need of reconciliation with your great God and Father. I want you to hear these words from Habakkuk as the Holy Spirit-inspired scriptures unpack a prophet of the Lord, somebody who speaks for God, feeling the same way we often do when those fears consume our thoughts. I heard and my heart pounded. My lips quivered at the sound. Decay crept into my bones and my legs trembled. I think all of us can think of at least one time in our life where that explains a life situation. I would argue, and I'll argue later, that I think that all of us actually have experiences like that right now as well. We'll get there. But I think what's important is Habakkuk has just heard if you're, if you're following through with us, Habakkuk has just heard that the God who promises to care for and redeem his people is planning to destroy those people with the very people who have rejected him. See, the people of Israel were intended to be a theocracy, which is a nation that's led not by a human, not by a king, not by a president, but by God himself. They were to be a shining example of God's glory to the world around them. Israel rejects often the wisdom and direction of God, and God allows them to experience discipline not because he, he hates them, but because he loves them, and he wants them to flourish. And that discipline is sometimes painful, hard to understand, confusing, terrifying. Habakkuk was afraid. Notice the change from the opening verse of the book of Habakkuk where he says, How long, O Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen? To the very first two words in verse 16, I heard. Habakkuk stopped to listen. Tom talked about this a few weeks ago. Sometimes we just need to stop talking and listen for God. Habakkuk complained, yes. He wrestled, yes. But he listened. And as you think on that thing that you fear, that deep-seated anxiety, the thing that grips you, I wonder, how often have you sat and listened for God in the midst of it? Habakkuk listened. We should listen. But notice that the knowledge of what's happening doesn't dissipate the fear. We can see in Habakkuk's statement, there's a fear of the Lord, right? He was just, just shown what's, what's called a theophany, this, this wonderful image of a powerful God. And so we see fear of the Lord. But this is also situated in the fear of the coming destruction of Judah. We can see that because as he goes through this person, an internal fear, he says, yet I will wait patiently for the day of calamity to come on the nation invading us. The place where his fear is situated is, yes, a fear of God, but it's also over the coming destruction of his friends and family and the people who God said he was going to redeem. Many of us, in our fears, respond with control or a desire to control. Right? We might do that through anger, Manipulation, pride, stubbornness, pouting. I guess arguably all those could be manipulation, but you understand what I mean? One of the hallmarks, though, I think, is that we often tell ourselves, and sometimes we tell God this, we try to bargain with him. We say, well, if you just told me why this was happening, I wouldn't be so afraid. 
If you just told me what was going on, God, my fear, it would be like I could handle it then. <laughs> but do, we, do you notice that we see Habakkuk experiencing that very thing, the knowledge, the understanding, this is what's happening in this moment, and his response isn't, oh, <laughs> good, okay, I can sleep easy now. It's the deepest description of fear we've seen Habakkuk explain yet. And I think we miss the fact, I think we often ignore this in our own lives, that while we, partially I think as a result of our culture, believe that having answers and knowledge brings peace, knowledge and answers can often bring, and I would say more often do bring great fear. There's one place, friends, where you will find peace. That is in the person of Christ. In Christ alone is where you will find perseverance in the midst of trials. And that word is important because you are not promised freedom from that fear or that thing. You're not promised it's going to go away. What God promises us is that in Christ, he will bring you to perseverance. And that's where our hope sits. So we don't find peace in a what. We don't find peace in knowledge or an understanding, but a who. Additionally, I think we misunderstand something about Scripture. I certainly have and struggle with this. If you've been in church for more than like a month, <laughs> you've probably heard at some point somebody saying a very true thing, which is that the number one command in Scripture is some form of the phrase, do not be afraid. It's the number one command. Different forms of it, take courage, take heart, be not afraid, do not be anxious, fear not. It's repeated hundreds of times throughout Scripture. Perhaps a favorite, at least it is for me, is perfect love casts out fear. What a promise. But I think that we in our contemporary culture have convinced ourselves that, that fear of anything is somehow sinful. I'm going to give you a really quick example. This goes out. I'm going to be really stereotypical for a minute. Please forgive me. Please have grace. If you are a Midwest dad, you should be afraid of tornadoes. <laughs> I have seen, there have been tornadoes ravaging the countryside, and I have seen too many videos of dads videoing it, and you can hear their family in the background going, Dad, come inside. Yeah, I'm fine, I'm fine. Dad, come inside. Yeah, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine, right? And, and their fence starts to get lifted, and they go, oh, okay, maybe I should go inside, right? <laughs> Fear can be a good thing, and it is a gift from God sometimes. Fear, at least not inherently or necessarily, is not sinful. And I think we misunderstand this. I think that we can see this in ways that our radio stations, as, as Christians, positive and uplifting music. That's a good thing. But our strong tendency to focus on positive and uplifting messages, our strong tendency to focus on victory and celebration in much of our worship music, and that's not just contemporary, by the way. It also exists in the hymnal, or hymn, ooh, hymnody is the word I was looking for there. I think we forget that the idea, or we don't forget, we, we imagine that the idea of fear, of pain and suffering and lament is one that needs to be avoided. We act like it's demonic or evil to experience those things. But not once in all of Scripture does fear show up in a list of sins. There's a whole lot of other stuff that's talked about in lists of sins. Fear is not one of them. Because we see different types of fear expanded on in Scripture. Fear of the Lord is good, right? It's the beginning of wisdom. Except it wasn't good to have fear of the Lord in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve were afraid and hid. So, there's range here. We see fear language in Jesus himself, God incarnate, when he's in the Garden of Gethsemane, and Scripture says that he was in agony and praying and sweating as if blood, as he was asking the Father to take the cup of wrath from him. The Apostle Paul, speaking on the many trials and struggles they experienced, said that we despaired of life itself. That's fear language. 
to say nothing of the countless psalms, some of which we've been reading, of those who have experienced and are experiencing fear. So we have to recognize that fear is a word that has what we nerds like to call semantic range. Semantic range. And I just lost everybody, right? All this means, it's just a fancy way of saying all this means, is that a word can be used in more than one way. It has a range of meanings. If someone asks me, Michael, how are you doing when I have a 103 degree fever, I'm probably gonna say, sick, right? That holds a different meaning than when I'm sitting in a roller coaster next to somebody, going upside down, twisting around, going, sick! <laughs> Same word, and we all fundamentally understand those have different meanings, right? So too does the word fear, including in scripture. Michael Reeves, I think, gives us a good explanation um, and summary of the difference between a sinful fear and what we might call a non-sinful fear, and I think it can be beneficial for us. He says that sinful fear is a fear of God that flows from sin and drives you away from God. Think Adam and Eve in the garden. This is the fear of the unbeliever who hates God or who fears being exposed as a sinner and so runs from God. Notice the example that we have in Habakkuk and in these psalms that we've been reading each week, they take their fears, Habakkuk took his fears, and he didn't run away from God, he ran to God with them. That is our call. So what are you doing with your fear? Are you seeking to hide it? Put on the happy Christian mask when you come into church because we're supposed to be positive and uplifting and absolutely no kind of pain or suffering exists in our world. Everything is good. God is good. Yes, that's a true statement. And you can also be afraid. So what are you doing with your fear? When we look at Habakkuk, we see he knows what the end plan is, right? Yet I'll wait patiently on the Lord to complete his plan, to bring calamity on the nation. I will trust in God, Habakkuk is saying. He's not running from God, from the very opening cry of the book. How long, O oh Lord, right? He's taking everything he has to God. Some of us are convinced that we have to fix ourselves and deal with our fear and conquer our fear on our own power before we can even begin to talk to God. But Hebrews 4 says we can boldly approach the throne of grace. So boldly approach, friends. In 2020, everyone's favorite year, there was a resounding call from a particular viewpoint around the pandemic. Faith over fear. If you took that position, please hear no judgment in what I'm about to say. That's not my intent. Lots of people came along with that, but I truly, truly believe that, that that statement, faith over fear, fundamentally misunderstands our humanity and how God has wired us. Because you are called to have faith in the midst of your fear, not somehow beat down your fear with the cudgel that is your faith. You take your fear to God. You don't use it as fuel to run from God. Our emotions are not the enemy. We have to be mindful and discerning about how we allow our emotions to guide us. Yes, the heart is deceitful. Yes. Fear, especially fear, can lead us to a whole manner of ungodly behavior, sinful behavior. It can lead us to hating others. It can lead us to ignoring others. It can lead us to failing to care for the poor and the oppressed in society. Fear can lead us to anger towards those we perceive as being the cause of our fear. Fear, by the way, is especially helpful and prevalent for our political candidates. This is not new. It is the number one rhetorical device that political candidates use, and it is a rhetorical device. It's a tool they use. They want to make you afraid of that other guy. And I've seen posts from Christians on social media and on Facebook. It's working. And fear often leads us to trust in our own human power for something that is completely out of our own power. 
And God is calling us to trust in his judgment. So the question is, where do you run from God or do you tr- wait patiently for the promises that God has given us in Scripture? As always, don't hear what I'm not saying. I can't, I can't motion to Tom Douglas because I stole it from him uh, months ago and he's not here this week. But don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying we should be apathetic. I'm not, I'm not commissioning apathy onto you. I'm not saying sit back and do nothing and just let things wait. I'm not saying don't have those conversations. Please have those hard conversations. Please ask the questions. Please be filled with prayer. Still do your best as though working for God and not for men. But one of the things we have to constantly do in our humanity is submit the tendency that we have to fear things that are out of our control. We have to submit that tendency to the hope of God's eternal plan that he's revealed to us. It is okay, friends, to be afraid. But you needn't allow that fear to control you. Instead, we are called to have faith through our fear in the midst of it. Yet I will rejoice. So Habakkuk continues, not only does his internal world, right, his body, the, the very being of who he is seem to be decaying and filled with fear, but even should the entirety of creation and all of society fall. Though the fig tree does not bud and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls. This is First, symbolic language, the idea here is that if everything in creation is done, fails, is gone, think post-apocalyptic cinema and worse. If all of that should, this is, this is um, complete removal of sustenance and security. And we see also then as a result of this that it's also a, a, a revelation that, a uh, small r revelation, it's a small, it's a revelation that if society completely fails and crumbles and falls around him, us, we can still rejoice. Romans says all of creation is groaning under the weight of sin. Habakkuk says even if it all fails, I will rejoice in the Lord says, I will be joyful in God, my Savior. Notice, he hasn't like stopped being afraid in this last sentence, right? This is connected to his fear. You are not somehow in sin if you are afraid and also faithful at the same time. If you haven't, I would again commission, we would again commission to you, uh, we don't have any copies here, but this book, Dark Clouds, Deep Mercy, Lament taking our fears and our pain and our suffering to God is a grace that we have from God, not a weakness. Habakkuk finds joy. Now we get into the more fun stuff. Habakkuk finds joy in God, his Savior. Now, salvation is a word that we kind of bandy about in church, and, and it becomes a, a, a kind of an unknown word. Sometimes we, we understand it a little bit. We're like, oh, well, I came to salvation at this point in time, or I came to salvation in this year, or after this situation, and it's a word that's fully filled with joy, and it should have joy in it, but I think, I think we forget what salvation implies. Salvation implies that you can't actually do the saving work yourself. Someone who's lost at sea, adrift in the storm, relies on the the grace and kindness of a passing ship to pick them up and give them continued passage and give them direction. Someone who is a farmer in an agrarian society or a shepherd whose entire crop has failed, whose entire livestock is gone. They have no food, no goods to trade for other material needs no social value. They need a savior. And that is the role that God is filling. I will trust in God, my savior. 
That's how we can have hope in the midst of deep pain and suffering because no matter what happens around us, God is still the Savior. Some of us need to be reminded of this more often than maybe we'd like to admit. If the United States economy fails, you will still have abundant life in Jesus. If your 401k tanks, if you lose your job, if you are dirt poor, if you lose your house, if, like Job, you lose your entire family, you can have abundant life in Jesus Your value, your dignity, and your life are not based in what you have accumulated or in what you have succeeded in doing. It is based in the redeeming work of the cross and the power of the resurrection. Nothing more, nothing less than God himself dwelling amongst us. All of society, all of life can fail. You can be terrified, and God will still be good through that. God is a God of salvation. When you are weak, he calls to you like he does in Matthew 11. Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, I will give you rest. Some of you have been carrying your fears and your anxieties so long that you just need rest. Go to Jesus. Learn from him. Take his yoke upon you, for he is gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is is light. In the midst of great fear and suffering, you can find rest. And Habakkuk is recognizing this joy in his Savior. And then he says, the sovereign Lord is my strength. And that word sovereign is really important because not only does the hope that Habakkuk is holding to require God to be sovereign and full control over everything that is happening, but it also puts Habakkuk into a position of humility. All of society has failed. God alone is my Savior, and He is sovereign, which means I can know that He is good on His promise. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to tread on the heights. Sometimes in our positive and uplifting Christianity, we take a verse like this, and we think, okay, well, that means that I'll be happy in all situations. It's not what it's saying. It's saying you will persevere in all situations if you are in Christ. One of the most brutalized verses in all of Scripture happens in Philippians, and I'm really excited because we're going to be going into the book of Philippians for our next series. And you probably know this verse, Philippians 4.13, right? Uh, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. And we slap that on sports logos. We make that our business mottos. Maybe put that on the bumper sticker of your car so everyone knows that you can merge even when the lanes are too tight. And we use this as this declaration of victory. So no matter what we're going to try and do, we can do it. And we completely rip that verse out of the context in which it's placed. Its immediate context starts in verse 12, where Paul is saying, I know what it is to be in need. And I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. The call of the Christian walk, the call even when we're lamenting, is not for accumulation. It's not even necessarily for your life to be comfortable. It is a call to contentment in the the good promises of a good father demonstrated through the dwelling of Jesus on earth with us and the cross and the resurrection. That is the call of the Christian walk. To glorify God and to enjoy him forever. We can enjoy God in the midst of our fears and pain. And that's what we see Habakkuk doing here. I will rejoice in the Lord. God isn't telling you that the thing that you're afraid of will go away or be resolved. Jesus himself said, in this world, you will have trouble. But then he goes on. Take heart, for I have overcome the world. And that's in the midst of Jesus saying, 
in me, in Jesus, you find peace. In the midst of your fear and confusion and anxiety, God is there with you. He's next to you, and you can trust in the ultimate ends that he has for you. And he will righteously judge everyone according to their deeds. Everyone. And when you or I, when we know and confess Jesus, we are covered in his righteousness. When I was at Trinity, I had a pastoral counseling class. And the very first day, the professor had us memorize a statement. It was, be kind, for everyone you meet is fighting a great battle or a hard battle. It's also sometimes quoted. That stuck with me all these years later. Thank you, Lee, for that. I remembered the phrase, but until a couple years ago, I didn't even remember who the teacher was. It was Lee, if that was unclear. <laughs> um, Each of us, every person in here, if you look around, I'm not saying do this, but if you looked around, every single person in here has something we're deeply afraid of or afraid for. Every single person. Afraid of wars. Afraid of what certain wars may or may not mean. Afraid of how low the bank account seems to be getting lately. Afraid of thinking, "Does does my son or daughter actually hate me? Are my parents getting a divorce because of me? Everyone in this room is fighting a great battle, but we do not fight alone, friends. We can be afraid. Our bones can feel like they are decaying within us. Our anxiety can be spiking. Our breathing can be shallow. Our vision can be blurry. Tears can be streaming down in mental or physical anguish. And amidst all of that, we can hold to the truth that we do not worship a God who has left us to fight these battles alone, but instead who fights our battles for us and gives us the supernatural empowerment of the Holy Spirit in order to strengthen us unto endurance and perseverance to the praise of his glory. All of creation groans around us. That includes you, by the way. As you get older, some of the younger kids, you're going to hear it as you get up in the morning, right? All of creation groans around us. Friends and family get sick and die. And yet we can rejoice in the Lord, not because we're ignoring the fear and the pain, but because we know that God has promised us that this life is but a prelude to life eternal, where he will wipe away every tear, where there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. There will be an eternity where we get to join the host of heaven singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And so I ask you, As you think on those things that you're afraid of, does your fear take you away from God? Is it the sinful fear? Or does it take you towards God like we see modeled in Habakkuk and the psalm writers? So how do we do this? How do we we join with Habakkuk to be rejoicing in the Lord, to trust in the sovereign God who can make our, our feet like that of a deer and help us to tread on these heights? I don't think there's one specific answer to this. There's many that kind of intermingle, but I do think we see a suggestion from how Habakkuk is is being inspired by the Spirit to think about this. Do you see it there, right at the end? For the director of music on my stringed instruments. That's not a notation, like a little, um, like sometimes the Psalms, you'll see a Psalm of David. It's not like that. It's a part of the inspired Word of God, music, singing, and we know this instinctively. We know that music gives voice to our emotions in ways that language by itself cannot do. The way harmonic chord structures move to create a pull in our heart, the way a melody complements a lyric that speaks to the core of our deepest struggles. When we in the U.S. experience a really brutal and terrible breakup, we listen to Alanis Morissette. Everyone who laughed is of a certain age, and I love you guys for getting that joke. (laughs) When we are mad or scared or happy, right? When we're mad at our parents or our children, when we're mad at our bosses or life or the government, or when we're mad at God, 
We have songs that we go to because there's something about them that helps us translate the complicated emotions we're feeling into something tangible. God made music to be a key component to navigating our emotions. I hear a lot of people in the Christian world, not necessarily in this church, but I hear a lot of people complain about emotion in worship music. Oh, it's too emotional. It's too emotionally manipulative. Listen, friends, there is nothing that should have more emotion than the music that we are singing as prayers and praise to the God of the universe. Zephaniah 3.17, one of my very favorite passages of Scripture, says, The Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. There's that Savior language again. He will take great delight in you. Hear the emotion here. He will take great delight in you, and in his love he will no longer rebuke you. Or some, some passages say that he will quiet you. He will give you rest. It says, God will rejoice over you with singing. God is a God who emotionally sings over his redeemed people. And some of us are afraid to sing on Sunday mornings. Now, because music has an emotional aspect, this is important, it can and does influence our emotional state as well. This is a reality of how this works. If you listen to lots and lots of music about how horrible life is, it is inevitable that you will begin to think that way. We are called to take every cap- thought captive and submit it to Christ. We are called to renew our mind. And one way we do that is when we sing by singing truths about God and who he is and what he has done. Singing is commanded over 50 times. It's commanded over 50 times in Scripture. That's 5 zero. There's over 400 references to God's people singing throughout Scripture. Music is important. We don't sing just because we're emotional. We allow our emotions to be present in singing, absolutely. But here's one of the beautiful things, friends. Singing together as the congregation is one of the graces of God. Because there's days when we come to church And our fears seem to be winning the fight. Our anxieties have grabbed us. Our selfishness, pride, ego are winning out. We put on the happy face still, but the reality inside is that our bones feel like they're decaying inside us. And hearing someone next to you or across the room sing truths of God is spiritually formative. It's formational for your soul. Sometimes I'll hear people talk about like when we're singing worship songs, that's really, it's like you're just singing to God. That's your, like an audience of one, right? I think that's actually not entirely accurate. Colossians 3.16 says, let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with using what? Or, I'm sorry, with all wisdom through using what? Psalms hymns, and songs of the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. So yes, vertical is absolutely one of the major components of singing worship, but there is a horizontal aspect to it as well. You, sitting here, actually perform the work of ministry to your fellow saints and the work of evangelism to any who might be visiting who don't currently believe through your vocal, sung worship. So we sing. I saw a funny video online recently where the caption was like, when you're mad, but a Christian. And I had this person like walking into frame, like hunched over, like really angry, right? And they walk through a door and they slam the door, right? And all of a sudden you hear music turn on and you hear, you hear on the other side of them shouting the words to blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord, right? Hilarious because to a degree, that's actually like what we see happening in scripture, Music is formative, it emotionally impacts us, and we can sing the truths of God to better align ourselves. Do you realize that this entire chapter in Habakkuk is is a song? The scary stuff of God's power, the fear stuff that Habakkuk is wrestling with, and the trust stuff 
at the very end. All of it is singing. We are not only called to sing positive and uplifting, feel-good, self-therapy worship. We're called to sing to God because He's worthy with all that we are and all that we are experiencing. And he, he intended, the Holy Spirit and, and Habakkuk intended this to be sung by the congregation, by the way. Do you want to know how I know that? Because it's for the director of music, who is the person who directs the music of the congregation and the assembly. This was intended to be sung together. So we're going to sing, no, I'm just kidding, we're not going to sing this, this chapter. But, <laughs> but I want you to understand that this is one of the beautiful benefits of having an embodied faith, a faith that is dependent on personhood and specifically being next to those who are in the faith, hearing the praises, the testimonies, and the singing of the fellow saints. I'm going to invite up Lisa Black to share a testimony, and as she's on her way, I just want to encourage you, when you are with the local church body, whether that's here on a Sunday or at prayer nights or at youth group or at men's breakfast or women's events, whether there's two of you or 200 of you, singing to God is an appropriate and I would even say encouraged way to navigate your fears and emotional state. God created you with emotions. God has emotions. There's a Never mind, I'm not going to do that part. We're going to have Lisa share a testimony with us. Thank you for being here, Lisa. Until 2008, I rarely ever got sick. Jim was working in the office of North American Baptist Conference when influenza went through the office until almost everyone working there came down with it. I think some of our kids caught it from Jim, but I didn't. We have four kids. They're all breathing on me all the time. I didn't get sick. However, I did notice that the lymph nodes in my neck were swollen. I just thought that that was my body's immune system was doing its job and fighting off all the nasty germs I was exposed to and at work in a nursing home. February turned into March, March to April, then May, and those dumb lymph nodes were still big. I'm an expert at denial. I knew this could be a sign of something really bad, but that is a word that starts with a capital C, and I didn't even want to think it could even be a slight possibility that it could be the C word. So I kept ignoring it, hoping it would go away, but it didn't. Instead, the lymph nodes were getting bigger. They didn't hurt, they were soft, but they were growing. Finally, I showed a friend who is also a nurse, and she said, you should have those checked. It's been too long. So I went to see an ENT doctor who put me on antibiotics. Nothing changed. He didn't seem concerned since they were soft and not painful or sore at all. He said they're probably enlarged due to all the illnesses I'd been exposed to over the winter, which sometimes takes a long time to resolve. I don't remember all the things he tried over the next four months, but nothing worked. I was to have a needle biopsy to determine if it was an infection or cancer of some sort, but it was postponed until sometime in October. On Labor Day, I became very ill. And I landed in the ER where, among other things, they did a CAT scan to rule out kidney stones. There were no stones in my kidneys, but there were some unusually large lymph nodes in my abdomen. Normally, they shouldn't be more than the size of a pea, and I had at least one that was about five inches in diameter. I moved beyond a little uneasy to very scared. All kinds of what ifs were running through my head. And none of those what ifs were good. So at that point, the plan changed. Instead of a needle biopsy where they just suck a little stuff out, I had a whole lymph node removed. And they sent it to labs, you know, they did their slicey dicey and sent it to different labs to figure out if it was just an infection or 
a generic cancer of some sort, to and this way they could just determine exactly what was going on. The surgery went really well, um, and it was on September 24th. I hadn't been sleeping well for months, because I was afraid. And I was so anxious over these stupid lymph nodes. I'd been asking God about a lot, about it a lot since May when I finally went to the doctor, but I, they just kept growing. My kids, this is kind of funny, so you're supposed to laugh here. My kids started teasing me that I looked like Frankenstein because <laughs> they were getting pretty big and it's Halloween coming up, you know, so they're like, you've got half your costume. Um, something incredible, though, started happening at night on the first night after that biopsy. At 3 a.m., I woke up with beautiful songs of praise and songs about God's greatness and all his awesome attributes. I just laid there and I kept singing the songs in my head until the alarm went off at about five because it was time to get up. This happened at 3 a.m. every morning for quite a while. I couldn't fall back to sleep. It was too beautiful and just uh, something for my soul. It took until the fourth morning before I realized that I wasn't waking up and starting to sing, but that the songs were waking me up. And I realized it was the Holy Spirit waking me up, singing praise songs into my soul and reminding me through these songs of God's power and his greatness and love beyond measure and that he is in control. Nothing surprises him. He has a plan. He is good. His plans are good all the time, always, even if I have cancer. His plan for me and my family is good. He will use it all for his glory. He'll even use my fear, my anxiety, my sorrow, all of it. He filled me with peace. And that just doesn't make sense. But I just had the best peace every day, all day. The call came one week, week later to tell me that I have non-Hodgkin's chronic lymphocytic leukemia. I wanted to shove the words back into the phone. I just really wanted to slap those words back in that phone and make them go back up to the doctor who was talking to me. Um, but, and I was still scared. But God is so much bigger than all my fears. And he continues to fill me with peace. Because of this diagnosis and the treatments, I've had wonderful opportunities to share my faith and pray with people. And God continues to wake me up on many mornings with a God song for the day. Thank you, Lisa. <clears throat> A month and a half ago, we joined with thousands of others in supporting family from our congregation as they sought to and continue to seek to navigate something horrific. Almost a year to the day before that event, Naomi and I were down in Nashville when the Covenant School shooting happened. Going to the prayer vigil that night in Nashville, going to the funeral recently, the thing that stands out to me is that in the midst of pain and confusion, we can stand together and protest the effects of sin and death in the world by joining our voices together in song, specifically in song that glorifies God and holds fast to his revealed truth to us. See, Habakkuk heard God's plan and he was afraid, but he trusted through the fear and he was singing about these truths. Habakkuk waited on the Lord, and now he awaits the fulfillment of the promise. And likewise, we have been given a real promise from God through the coming of Jesus as the incarnate Son of God, who bore the punishment of the cross as the propitiation for our sins, and rose in resurrection to point us to the promise of the coming final judgment where we will stand before a holy and righteous God. The promise has been given. Now the question is, will you listen 
Will you wait in the promise that we have in the righteousness of Christ for the final fulfillment? I know that you're afraid. I know this because I, I truly believe all humans are. I know that life can seem scary, uncontrollable, and filled with pain and suffering. Bonhoeffer said this well, and this was referenced in the Evangelical Dictionary of Theology. We, Christians, are challenged to participate in God's suffering at the hands of godless world. By ranging themselves with God and his suffering, Bonhoeffer claimed Christians distinguish themselves from the heathen. And heathen here meant not in a mocking way, meant merely as a synonym for someone who doesn't believe in the Christian God, but we do not suffer at the hands of a silent and disconnected God. He is a God who hears. So bring your fears to God in godly lament, looking to the future that he has for us all. We're going to close with two songs. The first, you know, we've sung it several times during this series, How Long, O Lord, How Long? As we're singing these truths to God and yes, to each other, I want you to hold in your mind that thing for which you're experiencing fear. Hold it out as you sing this. How long, God, will this continue to be the case? How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? Then we're going to sing another song, and some of you may know it. It's called You've Already Won. And I want us to hold to this truth that we have in Jesus alone, which is that we know how the story ends. We can overcome the weight of our fears, not by pretending they don't exist, by trying to tamp them down, but instead by trusting that our sovereign God who is over all is our strength as well. And unlike Habakkuk, we may not know what God is doing with a certain thing in our life. But like Habakkuk, we can look to what he has done and how he has been faithful. And in so doing, we can trust his promise for future final redemption. So hold that thing or those things as you sing these songs to the Lord. And let's learn as a church to lament honestly and well. When the sovereign Lord is our strength, we can rise above the troubles of this world and say like Habakkuk, he enables me to walk on mountain heights. Let us not only say this, let us sing this, and let us surrender our lives and fears and anxieties to the God who so loved us that even while we were still sinners, he died for us.